Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Princeton University Press Ideas Podcast, a joint production of Princeton University Press and the New Books Network. I'm Mark Klobus, and today I'm speaking with Martin Conway, author of the book Western Europe's Democratic Age, 1945 to 1968. Martin, welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thanks for agreeing to be on our podcast. I was wondering if you could start us off by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a historian in Oxford. I'm at Balliol College in the University of Oxford, and I've written a number of books about mid and 20th, late 20th century European history. And I got into writing this book about European Europe, Western Europe's democratic age a few years ago when I just became a bit frustrated that nobody was questioning the way in which democracy somehow won the second half of the 20th century in Europe. It really is a very fascinating subject. And as I was reading it, I could understand where you were coming from about it. It seems to be an age where we've taken that for granted to the point where it's effective. It's, it, you have to wonder if it's starting to jeopardize the gains that, that, that have been made in that time. Yeah, I think so. I was very concerned to emphasize that there was nothing inevitable or natural about the victory of democracy when Hitler died. You know, the idea that somehow all you had to do was kill Hitler and democracy would resume its place at the center of European history. You know, that's really not true, because if you look back over the previous 150 years of Europe before 1945, democracy had very rarely been entirely successful and certainly had never been uncontested. And yet, After 1945 in Western Europe, of course, I'm leaving the communist East out of this story, a very similar range of democratic regimes come into existence and remain in existence over the subsequent 30 or 40 years. There's very little regime change in post-1945 Western Europe. There are a couple of exceptions we can discuss. But predominantly what you have is a stable and durable democratic system, and that requires explanation. You begin the book by focusing upon a particular moment in this period. And this is, it's 1960, it's West Berlin, and you're referring to a a, a conference uh, at which uh, a French uh, intellectual named Raymond Aron uh, gives this speech in which he, he seems to be recognizing the, the, the moment that they're in, in, in that, that the the effort to introduce or establish democracy in the post-war world has uh had uh, success. It's, it's a very, it's very interesting how you use his speech to, to frame your approach to the subject and, and, and how you're presenting. I was wondering if you could perhaps explain a bit about Raymond Aron and what he argues in 1960 about democracy in Europe uh, in the post-war era. Yes, well, if Raymond Aron requires some explanation, he would be deeply offended because he thought he, <laughs> he thought he was one of the foremost, not merely French, but I suppose Western intellectuals of the post-war era, predominantly described as a liberal, if that really helps. But anyway, somebody who was an analyst of the way in which Western regimes, including North America, had stabilized into a regime of democracy after the Second World War, which, when he was speaking in 1960, he thought was essentially unassailable. Europe had passed through a sort of watershed whereby it had now arrived in a democratic order from which it would be impossible to escape. Now, there's plenty of problems with Aron's ideas. He came himself from an interesting sort of French intellectual background that had not excluded certain infatuation with uh, right-wing ideas in the 1930s. But by this moment, he really does see himself as something of a um, you know precocious sage of post-war politics. And he was speaking at the Congress for Cultural Freedom Conference in West Berlin, which was designed very much as a high-profile public uh, declaration of the way in which the West was defined by a regime of democratic freedom, in opposition, of course, to those people a couple of kilometers further east who apparently lived in communist enslavement. But So there's a propagandist purpose, but also for Aaron, there is a serious intellectual purpose. And he really did think that there was a stabilization of West European regimes that had happened after the war, based around economic progress, based around a certain regime of moderate liberalism, uh, which was established fundamentally for the post-war years. Of course, he didn't see many of the inequalities and shortcomings of that democratic regime. He didn't really pay much attention to the status of women. He was an opponent of the war in Algeria, but that did not necessarily make him an exponent of the rights of uh, people of colour in post-war France. And 
you know, a lot of his hopes would actually be disappointed. He got absolutely furious about what happened in 1968 because he thought that was infantile children throwing rocks at the police and not really a proper political challenge to the post-war order. And by the time he died in the early 1980s, he was obviously quite fed up at the way in which this democratic order was being eroded from left and right. But, you know, people can only say what they think in the moment. And I thought what he said in West Berlin, stood out for all its shortcomings as a statement of how, 15 years after the Second World War, many West Europeans not only thought they had arrived in democracy, but, and this is equally important, they thought of themselves as Democrats. That was a loyalty that was higher than mere political, you know, how you voted in elections. It was more a kind of way of being, a way of thinking of your identity. And that's one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was reading your book is you're not just talking about democracy as politics or democracy as a political system. You're describing how democracy, a, a culture of democracy, uh, the, the phrase you use, uh, 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 consumption of democracy, I thought was especially a fascinating one in, in, in how it's not just about how Europe has a democratic political system. It's how Europeans accept demo- uh, democracy as a, a, a sort of a starting point for who they are as a people. Yeah. Let's call them ordinary Europeans with all the shortcomings of that phrase for a moment. You know, what's happened over the previous 20 years is that a lot of Europeans have changed their political coordinates. They might formerly have been exponents of nationalism or some versions of authoritarianism, or on the left, of course, of a certain version of communism that was essentially tied up with revolution. But by the time you get to the 1960s, I think most Europeans, even if they might, for example, still vote communist in elections, nevertheless think of themselves as participating in a democratic process where you win, you lose, and above all, in post-war Europe, you share power and you exercise a certain power even as an ordinary European with, um, you know, in in your daily life, in uh, the workplace, and in the exercise of your sovereignty as a voter, as a man and a woman in regular post-war elections. That doesn't mean you rule in the manner of 1917 and charging the barricades and throwing a red flag over the top of the Tsar's palace, but it means that you actually have some influence. And I think if you want to sum up what happens after 1945, is most Europeans trade dreams of power and of of, of victory in favour of influence, influence in daily life, but also influence in the political process. Uh, Let's go back and and talk about how those systems were constructed, because it's it's fascinating to consider that he is celebrating a triumph that 15 years previously would have been unimaginable considering the conditions within Western Europe, not just politically, but materially. It it, that that Europe that uh, Western Europe was was uh, physically devastated. It was economically disrupted. It was uh, politically gutted in, in many respects, and and how that in in some ways uh, you had uh, the 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 key uh, politicians uh, starting from scratch, but they were also at the same time in other respects having to overcome some of those prejudices and biases against the system that they were now endeavouring to construct. Yeah. There was a great sense in 1945 that Europe was in ruins, but some cities were. But it was more a sense that actually the whole political order was in ruins because there wasn't really a usable past. Obviously, some pre-war regimes such as Nazism were beyond the pale now and fascism in Italy. But also there was a broader sense that actually previous democratic regimes had essentially ended in failure. You know, the Weimar Republic, you might think it was better than Nazism, but it has essentially been, in many people's minds, the origins of Nazism, because it was by votes and by the democratic process that Hitler had established a position of influence in Germany, even if he then used that, uh, then subvert, subverted that by undemocratic means. And think of Italy and the, and the March on Rome by Mussolini, or think of the rather ignominious collapse of France in 1940 of the Third Republic. You know, there isn't very much by way of democratic regimes to go back to. So when people start thinking about a stable democratic order after the Second World War, they don't look for models in history. They look for for modern models. They look for future-oriented models. 
You said politicians. It is partly politicians, and a lot of politicians quietly migrate from being critics of democracy to being defenders of it during the war years because of the experiences they encounter. But it's also a broader elite group than that. It's also about civil servants. It's about engineers. It's about the leaders of companies. It's about trade union leaders. These are all people who find in democracy not the most heroic victory they might have hoped for, but a rather pragmatic model of sharing power, which after the upheavals of the previous, well, not just the war years, the previous 15 years, perhaps, if you go back to the Great Depression, after those experiences, they want to um, settle for a rather moderate, modest stable stability in post-war Western Europe. And so they work very diligently, in really quite a sort of technocratic way at constructing political constitutions and models of economic corporatism and forms of local government that they think will meet that need for stability. And they do all that, essentially, to exaggerate a a little, without the people. They set about creating the um, almost the sort of the palace of a new democratic order, And then rather in the manner of opening the gates of some new theme park or something, they open the gates and let the people in, in a rather moderate, measured way uh, to participate in that program, in that process through referenda initially to approve new constitutions, but then more routinely through the organization of elections and the creation of lots of local councils and the like. If the people come last in this process, not because uh, they're not part of the process, but because A lot of fear surround the people. The people had proved themselves to be distinctly untrustworthy in the minds of many elite figures over the previous, well, perhaps 100 years in terms of their enthusiasm for revolutionary causes, their willingness to be um, subverted or seduced by demagogic leaders. Think of Hitler, think of Mussolini, of course. Um, And therefore, there's a need to create a democratic order where the people won't be sovereign, but the people will be participants. It's also important to note that during this period, during the early years of this, there's also a counter model that they're trying to steer away from, and that's the al- the alternative of people's democracy that uh, the communists are promoting in places like France. Because it, with uh, the end of the war, there is uh, the communists have have a certain status that they hadn't enjoyed previously, thanks to their resistance, and, and they're promoting this alternative model in France and Italy and elsewhere about how this is what it should be. It should be more about empowering the people. It should be about giving them that. And and it, it, they're not just trying to avoid the, the, the resurgence of Nazism or resurgence of fascism. They're also trying to avoid, you know, going, you know, crashing against these rocks as well. Yeah, the more immediate victory of communism. Yes, Mark, you're absolutely right. And this was something I became more and more conscious of when I was writing the book, the extent to which... If you're not careful, what you what you see is only one hand clapping here. You only see uh, the exponents of Western democracy. You don't see the fact that they are often responding, often quite urgently, to what they fear are the blandishments of a communist East. The communist East, which doesn't look like some sort of um, Stalinist um, a nightmare, they think in the immediate post-war years, it looks like an enthusiastic process of social transformation and political reconstruction, material reconstruction as well as creating a new Poland or a socialist Czechoslovakia and so on. And therefore, there's a real sense of a competition here between two models of democracy. And I would emphasize that the East, the communist world, very much calls itself democratic, indeed, probably gets to the term democracy earlier than the West. In the East, the idea is that they will construct a people's democracy, which, of course, is rather different from what we might regard as contemporary democratic norms. It's much more about mass movements. It's much more about social equality than it is about real political choice. But, you know, in the circumstances of immediate post-1945 Europe, there was a sense that quite a lot of those issues were more urgent for many Europeans than political choice. And therefore, there is a strong sense of actually needing to to emphasize, to underscore the democratic credentials of West European states as a way of countering uh, that challenge from communism. And I would say that it was successful. You know, because another big element that comes over to me from all of this is that support for communism in Western Europe might have peaked around the level of 25 percent, 30 percent in Italy and France in the immediate post-war years. But it soon declines, partly because of the actions of the Soviet Union, but principally because I think communism becomes a product that actually only a small minority of West Europeans really want to consume fully. And therefore, there's a sense that actually Western Europe becomes anti-communist. 
and defines its democracy in those anti-communist terms. Uh, let's talk a bit more about the, the model of, of stable democracy that's constructed, in particular, how it was constructed uh, more with the previous experiences of failed democracy in mind, rather than the more immediate experiences of your fascist systems that you saw in Central Europe, or the you know, we could also perhaps mention for those places that weren't fascist, they had the occupation model, shall we say. Uh, wh- wh- how did they use, wh- what were those ex- previous experiences like, and, and, and how did they use them to uh, to guide them in terms of constructing systems that they uh, hoped or believed would be more durable? Yes, the black myths of past democracies, isn't it? Because, you know, I would emphasize that this experience, events such as the Weimar Republic were um, not as half as bad as people thought they were in retrospect. But, you know, three things that people held against these interwar democratic regimes. One, they had somehow, somehow failed the test of government, you know, that they had led to short, frequently changing governments, often characterized by a certain level of corruption and by um, an incoherence in dealing with issues such as economic crisis, mass inflation, and so on. Uh, I'm not saying that any other regimes did better, but that was held against those democratic regimes. Secondly, uh, they had failed the challenge of leadership. They had failed to set kind of a clear purpose for the population and had become absorbed in an inward looking democratic game where it was all about party maneuvering, indeed individual maneuvering, and about the the gaining advantage in some sort of parliamentary zero sum game over a rival contestant. And thirdly, they had kind of failed the te- a test of, shall we say, civil society, they had failed to reach out to wider sections of society and had created and created more broadly based democracy. There's a strong sense after 1945 that what had been wrong with these past exercises in democracy is that they had been simply too political. They had been far too much about voting and about people in parliament making grand oratorical speeches, and they hadn't been about creating democracy in society. And so there's a very strong sense after 1945 that we need to resolve those three crises. We need to have, first of all, that much more broadly based democracy that exists in society as much as it does in politics. Uh, Secondly, that we had to have new sorts of political parties that would cast off a certain sort of ego selfishness in favour of a a, um, much more consensual model of rule, broadly based coalitions and the like. And thirdly, the competence issue, that they would actually bring into the process of government various skills such as Keynesian economics and wartime planning that would create a much more stable, prosperous future than the much more short-lived, sort of budget-driven democracies of the interwar years. Now, you describe what is effectively the consensus that 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 uh, is being uh, that that shared among the people that are involved in this, but within that consensus there are indeed divisions, and and you uh, characterize them in terms of the basic uh, polarization that took place in post-war European politics between uh, Christian democratic uh, parties on, on on the right on the one hand, and then your social democratic. Uh, parties on the left. I was wondering if you could if you could explain a bit what uh, characterized these groupings, basically what you know made them center right, center left, as opposed to more you know extreme uh, you know segments on their side, and then also the the, the visions of, of democracies that that the center right held, the center left held in terms of the differences from one another. Yeah, yeah. So a consensus with deep divisions, you say, right? That's an interesting. <laughs> A combination of qualities I shall try and articulate. I suppose uh, you know, historians tend to run away from the word consensus because everybody can immediately think of the exceptions. But, you know, let's say that there is a broad convergence around certain norms of democracy that I've already talked about. But Which within that, yeah, within that, then there's there's this certainly this fault line between what becomes what I suppose self describes itself as a centre right and a centre left. In many European West European countries in the 1950s and 60s, you've got something like 75 to 80 percent of the electorate voting for socialist parties and for Christian Democrat parties. Of those, it's often the Christian Democrat parties that have the upper hand. They have probably more votes. It's well known, of course, that Adenauer became the first post-war chancellor of Germany in 1949 and remained so for 15 years. That is a remarkable ascendancy of a Christian Democrat political leader and of the party, the Christian Democrat Union, uh, which you know essentially had appeared from nothing. 
And all these Christian Democrat parties after 1945 in Western Europe are essentially new bills. There have been previous Catholic political organizations in most West European states, but it's only after the Second World War that you get the relaunch of this much more broadly based form of, you know, let's call it Catholic inspired politics, because it breaks away from any sort of slavish adherence to the Vatican and is much more about actually creating a broader influence of Catholic values in society, including a new family and belief that actually democracy was Christian, which, you know, is not something that most people would have thought in Europe before 1940. But after 1945, there's a, you know, perhaps not always plausible, but very insistent um, emphasis on the Christian character of democracy. And what's going on there is the idea that Christianity brings a particular vision of democracy to the post-war world, one that's not about totalitarian states, about nationalism, about individual leadership, and much more about the devolution of power to responsible organisations, could simply be regions and local government, but it's also social and economic organisations, it's professional groupings, it's farmers' leagues, and so on women's groups as well. And they create this vision of how the mature democracy that's going to be created after the Second World War is above all participatory and is above all about the way in which actually power will be shared and things will be negotiated and compromised. And that's very different from a kind of winner-takes-all vision of democracy that tended to dominate up until 1940. So that's a, you know, a Christian Democrat vision. And it's one that is remarkably successful even among people who probably didn't say their prayers last thing at night before they went to bed. You know, this has a social constituency that is broader than people who you might regard as conventionally practicing Catholics or indeed Protestants in some area of Europe. It's much more about people who are sympathetic to those sort of ideas. Now, you ask about the other poll, which is social democracy. Socialism originally, as it's called, but social democracy by the 1960s. And that evolution in language is, of course, quite interesting. In comparison with the Christian Democrats, of course, the socialists have been here forever. They go back all the way and make a great deal of din about how they can go back to the 1870s and 1880s, parties like the SPD in Germany, the SFIO in France. Um, but what matters after the Second World War is that they they move rather hesitantly, often slightly incoherently away from a reliance on a sort of Marxist economic determinist interpretation of where the modern world is headed and become much more preoccupied with how they can create a democracy here and now, often through municipal power bases in major cities and also through using their trade union movement, which is on the whole broken away from alliances with the communists and therefore how they can create a vision of a socialism that they build almost one house at a time uh, with the emphasis on housing projects after the Second World War and about creating a socialism that is at ease with a certain level of inequality. It's a socialism that won't be trying to achieve a material, a absolute equality of material conditions and it will be instead be one that's actually aiming for a certain sort of moderate inequality but one with opportunities higher education, promotion at work, emphasis on technology, emphasis on small businesses. These are all new constituencies that they're trying to bring into social democracy. It's not easy. And it's only in the 1960s that that sort of electoral recipe begins to really attract, especially younger generations of voters. But in the end, they do succeed in creating this sort of bipolar a political model in many areas of Western Europe, where there is recognisably a centre-right and a centre-left, who can even share power with each other at times, notably in Austria, but who above all provide these sort of alternative poles of belief almost within post-war Europe. Now, up to this point, we've been focusing upon what we might characterize as the production of democracy. And we can characterize it this way because you then shift your focus to what you label the consumption of democracy, and that is the the building of a democratic culture. Because you make it clear, it's not enough simply to say, here is a democracy, here is the system, you're not going to go, you're not going to vote. It's about achieving a uh, an acceptance among the, the, the public to where this is the system that they uh, prefer and, and that they uh, are participating in. And as you described, uh, that, that's one of the greatest successes of this period is the degree to which people do indeed embrace democracy and it becomes uh, a, a part of their identity as uh, as Frenchmen, as as Italians, as West Germans, and also uh, more collectively as West Europeans. 
Yes, as West Europeans, and that's interesting in itself, isn't it? Because there's also within this uh, new identity of democracy a willingness to kind of see loyalties that stretch beyond the nation state. And that's, again, really rather new in Western Europe after the Second World War. And I think democracy is one of the ways that actually Western Europe finds its way out of the sort of zero-sum uh, nationalist conflicts that have essentially dominated international relations in Western Europe since the 18th century. Uh, but you're quite right that this issue of consumption of democracy is one that came to came to absorb me quite a lot because, you know, perhaps rather like the advocates of democracy after 1945, I became interested in the way in which democracy had to be broader than a political system and the extent to which this leached into a broader pattern of value shift in Western Europe after 1945. We're familiar with certain elements of this. You know, the idea that perhaps in the 1950s people are consumers and almost as consumers deciding which material white good to buy, they might therefore choose between different uh, brands. Then also in their politics, they might consume in a rather similar way by choosing between different political parties. That, I think, is a kind of rather familiar vision of how uh, a certain sort of economic consumer logic enters into politics. But I wanted to go further than that. I wanted to talk about the way in which then people actually behave towards each other in newly democratic ways. Up until 1940, the, you know, the standard way of having a political debate in France was often to engage in a certain amount of rather theatrical street fighting in which relatively few people died, uh, but with, in which heads got broken and a great deal of shouting took place. Uh, after 1950, you see very little of that in Western Europe, partly because the police are probably more efficient, but also because I think there's a, there's a, a broadly shared view that actually that sort of violent confrontational politics is not a good idea. There are plenty of issues on which Europeans disagree rather fundamentally. Um, one thinks of decolonization, one thinks of issues of nuclear weapons and so on. But it's interesting that often the theatre of those uh, divisions is played out in a really rather managed way, peace demonstrations, silent sit-downs, that sort of thing. And then above all, then the emergence by the 1960s of a you know, rather um, complacent, perhaps rather pleased with itself, um, to a culture of democratic debate. The idea that the way that we prove that we are better than the Soviet East, is by the way we can have discussions where people disagree with each other but don't shoot each other, and whereby this actually demonstrates the way in which Western Europe can cope with diversity and conflict and reasoned debate. There's a, yeah, there's a lot about this that is rather theatrical and rather staged, shall we say, particularly the emergence of a new generation of intellectuals who play this game, uh, with whom most of the population are probably rather uninterested. But there is a sense here that actually democracy should be how you behave, how you dress, how you address each other, whether you should stand up when somebody more senior to your with greater social status comes into the room. All these things do change. And, you know, there's an element of this that we haven't yet touched on, which is also that of gender and how this is about uh, according women a vote, uh, a voice, a vote, initially, as I was about to say, but also more generally a voice, yeah, that they were actually uh, going to be participants in this democratic process, who had views of their own and ought to be listened to. As you know, if my students never ceased to tell me, you know, there was no gender equality in post war Western Europe, and they're right to remind me of that. But there, is, there are different forms of inequality. And what's interesting about women in most West European states after 1945 is that they have a certain social citizenship and they have a legitimacy to speak out on what were in many ways the most pressing issues of the day about housing, about education, about welfare, about childcare. We, we might regard as rather, well, as distinctly gendered, but of course they were the issues that were foremost in the minds of many women at that time, and there is a space for them to speak. So I don't want to get too utopian about all of this, but it's interesting how uh, men became win become willing to listen to women in politics, even if the male political world is still rather impervious to senior female politicians. I was thinking uh, in particular of uh, one of the best examples of this is the picture that you have in your book of one of Adenauer's cabinets. And I, I thought the caption made the point of, uh, quite well, which is you have, you know, this group you, you met, you described it as it's a group of men and one woman. And you know, it's, it's a caption you can read one of two ways. One way you can view it as here you are in the 1960s, this group of, of middle-aged older uh, gentlemen 
who have now not only are women voting, but they're actually in in positions of of, of running you know departments and and, and ministries and making and, and the, their their voices there, and, and and that in itself is an, a considerable achievement, considering that in many of the country in some of the countries that we, you're talking about here, women didn't even have a vote necessarily 15, 20 years previously. But conversely, it's a group of men. And one woman, <laughs> and it, 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 it's like you, you, you're, you're catching the transition, both in terms of the progress that has been made and how much progress has yet to be made. Yes, I think you look at that photograph and you think, well, there was much that remained to be done. I just given a little speech about what had been achieved, I suppose, over the previous twenty years, which is actually the legitimacy of women being in such meetings. But you rightly point to the extent to which uh, the male quasi monopoly over higher levels of political power remains very tangible and you know in the you know don't make me don't let me don't be misunderstand me that I somehow think this is right but in by the standards of the time you know this was seen to be to some extent the natural order men had certain skills that were needed in the process of government and therefore it was quite natural that there should be a majority of men in these positions of power but these men um, are perhaps also slightly different from previous generations of men. These are not men in uniform. They are men in suits. They are men who often portray themselves when it comes to election time as family heads of families, family men, and so on, fathers and, so, and, and husbands. And that, although it might strike us as horribly twee nowadays, you know, is also about the idea that uh, we were moving away from the model of rather militant male politics that one had seen in communism, in fascism, and indeed in many democratic political parties over the previous 30 or 40 years. You know, there's a sense here that we're there, they are also different sorts of men. But you're quite right to point to the fact that this means that this post-war political order was very uh, reluctant to absorb any ideas of a more radical, more fundamental gender equality. And that, of course, is going to be one of the origins of the disturbances in 1968. And that actually brings us to those disturbances, because you know, going back to uh, the beginning of your book, Aron's speaking at a particular moment where he is uh, an, where he's effectively celebrating the, the success that's been achieved, but he's doing so on the cusp of a decade where the, you're going to start to see criticisms with uh, internally of the limitations of that uh, in, in terms of uh, women, in terms of uh, people of color, in, in, in terms of most dramatically, of course, of youth, mm. and, and how it, they're not necessarily, and, and how these protests are, uh, are demonstrated, as you explained, the, the, the limits of, of what's been achieved and how uh, and how you know things need to change, but it also demonstrates, in, in some respects, the resiliency of the system because you have these protests and the system can adapt rather than collapsing and being replaced by a people's democracy or being replaced by uh, a, a one-man authoritarian regime. Yes, I mean, there is a strong sense in the 60s that there's no desire to go back to some sort of authoritarianism of the past, however much somebody like de Gaulle in the middle of the night might sometimes, sometimes think that would be a good idea. Uh, and certainly no enthusiasm to go towards the, the say, socialist model of Eastern Europe, which after, say, the Hungarian uprising of 1956, doesn't seem like a model that could be applied to Western Europe. But, yeah, there's a broader destabilizing of the post-war democratic order that I've been describing, which takes place across the 60s. It starts long before 68, I would suggest, you know, in the early 1960s, in response to moments of decolonization, in response to the emergence of new forms of democracy. People look to the third world. They look to Ghana, they look to Algeria, they look to Vietnam, and they see what they think what they see there are much more exciting and more grassroots versions of democracy. And the people who look that far and indeed can see it through their new television televisions are predominantly the young. And so there's a kind of um, challenge to European democracy that emerges through the uh, new visibility of these other forms of democracy. And this builds up across the 60s. I don't like to mention the year that lies between 1967 and 1969 too much, because I think that there's always a rather uh, myopic emphasis upon particular street demonstrations and the like. And I think what is much more interesting 
is the broader social mobilization at the end of the 60s, including, for example, large-scale strikes, including the emergence for the first time of explicitly immigrant political movements in Western Europe, and, to go back to where we were five minutes ago, also the emergence of a very articulate and rather intransigent women's movement that will not accept the half measures of social citizenship and wants an equal political citizenship, but through that also the dethroning of Uh, conventional binary gender assumptions as being the basis of the social order. Instead, there should be a much more fluid understanding of gender and a a dethroning of of the notion that gender should define identity or more especially life expectations. And I think that 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 the development of that of those new radical voices is very interesting. It's obviously associated particularly with new generations. And let's not forget that many people were born in Western Europe around 1945, 1946, 1947, for reasons we might be able to understand. And it's these people who are coming of age at the end of the 60s and who are populating the new university campuses that were almost designed to be forums, if not a revolution of contestation at the end of the 1960s, especially when they were so badly built. And this creates a kind of new culture of protest in Western Europe that doesn't have the polite formulae of the post immediate post-war order and is much more about actually going out and throwing things and going out and in some cases by the 1970s, of course, engaging in certain violence, forms of political assassination and the like, none of which destroys democracy and wasn't intended to destroy democracy, but it was intended to move towards a new, larger, bigger, greater democracy. And that becomes the theatre of the 1970s between the defenders of the post-war Western order and those who would advocating a more uh, far-reaching democratization of society and politics. And that's where you uh, conclude your book. You, you, you talk in, in one sense, you get to the 1960s and it, it, you can see how the system has survived its first really significant internal uh, challenge, but that it's not it's not the first that you have uh you know, you do have uh, groups that that do resort to violence uh the red brigades in italy the red army faction germany in west germany excuse me and how and how these and you have the, those alternate models that you've referenced that that they look at in place of the third world where it seems that they're actually they're more, more bravely trying things that if they uh, succeeded as advertised would deliver so much more than the democratic systems that the post war uh that, that the uh, post-war leaders had developed and, and how these challenges never go away. And yet you find, you, 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 I, I found in your description, a, a sense that that all of this is demonstrated, not necessarily the, the perfection of the system, but the, the resiliency that it's uh, the people who were involved in creating it had aspired to and, and, and probably would, would be ju- would be very proud of. Yes, indeed. You know, Raymond Aron dies in 1983, I think it is, you know, and he, his last works are very critical of this, um, these radical groups that have emerged. But, you know, if he had lived on for a few years, then I think he would have been quite impressed by the way in which by the later 1980s, of course, Western Europe has entered a new era of relative political stability associated with Mitterrand as French president, with Helmut Kohl as West German chancellor, but then above all, by the divine surprise of 1989, when the other half of Europe uh, falls down like a pack of cards and they can celebrate the reunification of Europe within democracy, which is really something that nobody could have expected to happen, especially as it happened almost without any uh, deaths at that point. So there is there is that moment when the sun comes out. But I think you're right to talk about this period of contestation and the extent to which by the 1970s and 80s, some of the founding principles of the democratic order I describe in the later 1940s have really very much fallen away. The generation that came to power after 1945 have largely left the stage. And what you're left with is a resilient political order as constructed around parliaments and elections, and indeed around the dominance still of major political parties. But there is a sense of um, disgruntlement with the democratic regime and the inequalities that it has produced. And there are new forms of political ideology developing. One thinks of what we now call neoliberalism, of a new sort of market-oriented liberalism. One thinks of the new left that emerged out of 1968. And then also there is a new right, isn't there? There's a new populist right that probably achieves its greatest success and greatest first success with uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen's Front National, National Front in France in the mid-1980s. 
And suddenly that narrowed political spectrum that came into existence after 1945 has been replaced by a much broader political spectrum where the potential winners and losers are much broader and where the possibility for some sort of more fundamental rethinking of the democratic system is possible. And I suppose Britain and Thatcherism and the emergence of a new sort of privatised culture of market choice is one of the examples of how democracy can be changed at the end of the 20th century from within. Hmm. Well, we've taken up a lot of your time, but before we go, could you tell us what you're working on now? Hmm, Yeah, well, I, I suppose I have two things in mind. One is Um, A lot of people when reading this book have started talking about, well, you should write another book on democracy and you should talk about democracy in the present. And as you will know from reading the book, I end rather unsatisfactorily with this idea that what we've ended up with in the 21st century is a regime of post-democracy. And I think that that's really rather unsatisfactory. And I'd be much more interested in talking about how what we see with the upheavals in Europe and in North America in recent years is a sort of rather difficult birth pangs of some sort of new democratic system. It may not be as stable as the previous one. Indeed, I think instability seems one of its foremost characteristics. But I think there's a need to talk about that. And I expect I shall be writing quite a lot about that. But You know, historians, if they come too close to the present day, they often get a bit of a nosebleed. So, you know, I've also been trying to go back to rather more long standing themes in my work. And one of those which has emerged in recent years is men, which, you know, might strike you as a rather strange subject. But I think that we've become rather preoccupied, rather overly preoccupied, perhaps, with talking about the changing status of women in politics in Europe, at least in the 20th century. And there's a big story to be told there. And it continues to be told. And it's a good story and an important one. But then what about the men? Let's try and problematize the idea of men as political citizens in 20th century Europe. And let's see how, for example, the role of being a man in politics changes between, let's say, the 1930s and the 1940s or the 1960s or the 1980s. You can immediately think of really very different forms of male political engagement in those years. So I have a working title of a book called Political Men that will try to look at these different generations of male political involvement in Europe from roughly the First World War uh, up until roughly 1989. And I'll see where I get with that. Well, those both sound like fascinating projects. I I look forward to seeing them when they come out. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today, Mark. Well, Well, thank you for taking some time to speak with us, Martin. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much indeed.